In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and progeny. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For the beginning of the lesson, there was a little bit of a request to give a little bit of an outline on the general structure of these lessons or these lectures and discussions. So I thought I'd take maybe two or three minutes just to explain what I think is going to be the the outline, at least of the topics that we're going to be addressing. And then depending on your level of interest in them and how much questions and discussion we get for all of each of them, we'll decide how many lectures we spend on on each one of the topics. So if topics where we get a lot more discussion, a lot more questions, they're probably going to deserve to go a lot more in depth and to talk about things in a lot more detail. Those that we can skim over quickly and just give an overview, where an overview is enough, they would probably be limited to perhaps one lecture or one lesson, one discussion. So as you guys have seen, we started talking about the importance of religion And between this session and the next, you'll see that, inshallah, we're going to finish this topic of the relationship between reason and faith. And we'll also talk about this next topic, which is the different types of knowledge that we have and their place in the big picture of knowledge, all the types of knowledge we have, and their functions or functionality, how we use them, what they're useful for, what are the tools that we need for each one of them and what are the objects that we study with each of them and on the other side we'll also study this topic that we refer to in our religion as taqlid so we need to understand what taqlid actually means and how it fits into this picture of using our reason rationality our logic when we approach religion so can we really follow blindly someone else or not and how are these two compatible Once these few topics are out of the way, we'll get into the topics that are usually studied in the field of aqaid or theology, the belief system. So we'll start talking about the proofs for the existence of God, the attributes of God, and one of the biggest ones, and it causes a lot of questioning and doubts and confusion is a specific attribute of justice so when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just what does it mean and the big topics that we usually study under those is the issue of evil in the world and also the issue of free will do we have free will or not and why is there evil in the world so those two are studied under the end of the attributes of God which is al-adl divine justice then we move on to the big topic that is usually referred to as Nubuwa, so the study of prophethood. So we started that one by studying the importance of religion and why do we need religion in a different way than what we've talked about until now. And then we'll start talking about the importance of why do we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent people with a message to humanity. So the prophets, who are the prophets? What are their general attributes? And this whole issue of isma or infallibility is also studied there as well as the notion of miracles and what constitutes a miracle and how do we know whether it's a real miracle or not and of course here we can decide together as a group when we'll reach that topic whether we want to spend a little bit more time specifically about our own prophet and our own prophet's miracle which is the holy quran or do we just give a quick overview and keep going in the lessons and then we can come back after we give the whole overview and give a lot more detail about the life of our holy prophet and studying the the holy quran once we understand the importance of prophethood and the big proofs demonstrations to prove that there are messengers apostles prophets sent by god and what are their attributes and what miracles are and how we study them we go into the topic of imam and we understand what are the big proofs, what's the discord or disagreement among Muslims about this topic of imam? What do the Muslims in general say? What do they agree on and what do they disagree on that makes them fall into different schools of thought? 
and what are our proofs for our own school of thought and our beliefs in this notion of imamah. So again, the same thing that we would have done with the nubuwa, we would do with the imamah. What constitutes, what are the traits, the attributes, characteristics of someone who is an imam? Where do they rank? And how do we know that they are an imam as opposed to someone else, for instance? Once that topic is done, then we move to the last of the topics of what we usually call Usul al-Din, which is everything that happens from the moment of death upwards or onwards. So what is death? What happens when we die? What awaits us in the grave? What happens between the moment we are put in our graves till Yawm al-Qiyamah? What happens on the day of judgment, Yawm al-Qiyamah? And then what is the afterlife after the Day of Judgment? So all of these are topics that fall under this big heading of the afterlife. So generally speaking, this constitutes our system of beliefs in that specific order. And each one of these topics, each one of these subjects builds on the ones before. So when you miss, you're going to miss a part of the demonstration. You're going to miss a part of the, the, the system. Following that, the idea with this entire jalsa, the idea that I had was basically to provide an overview of our religion. So I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this notion of beliefs or aqaid because it's the foundation of our religion. But beyond the aqaid, there are also a few other things that constitute our foundational knowledge of our religion. One of those is what we can call big systems in Islam. So the biggest one that is relevant to us is the system of laws in Islam. So we can look quickly at the big laws in Islam for the parts that are really relevant to us. For instance, tahara or purity in Islam. For instance, prayer, fasting, charity, both zakat and khums, pilgrimage. These are the big chapters in Islamic law that we can look at as an overview. A couple of other systems that are very important is understanding the system of the family in Islam. So we have to look at every member of the family. So the man, the woman, the, chi the children, and their roles. So within the family and within society. What does Islam say about all of this? And then beyond that, we look at the social system in Islam. What does a society look like in Islam? How does Islam look at a society? And within that, we can also talk a little bit about the economic system in Islam. How does Islam view economics or the financial aspect of a society? Because these are very important in the big picture in Islam. The idea is that all of this taken together gives us a, an overview of Islam. Then, depending on your level of interest, depending on the discussions we have, the questions we get, there are three other topics that are either going to be embedded in all of those as we go along, or will dedica dedicate specific series of lectures to them. One of them has to do with akhlaq, or ethics and spirituality. A second one has to do with history and biographies. So akhlaq, also we would spend time trying to understand the human soul. What is it made of? What are its different faculties? What makes it stronger or weaker? How do we control it better? That falls under akhlaq. History and biographies is more understanding the life of the Holy Prophet and the beginning before Islam. Islam, and then all of the imams, the 12 imams. So studying their lives. And we could, if we wanted to, also add the lives of the prophets or not in the history part. And then finally, perhaps the biggest, most in-depth and interesting and widest and deepest topic is the Holy Quran. So once we've had a little bit of a background now that we understand a little bit our religion and we have some of the tools we need, we can start studying the Qur'an. So here we can also decide, either we study it in a way that's usually called thematic, so we take a theme and we see what the Qur'an says about that theme. 
So take a topic, a subject, and we see what the Quran says. So for instance, it could be, what does the Quran say about prophets? So that's a theme. And we go throughout the Quran, we only take out the verses that have to do with this topic, and we see what the Quran says about them. This is usually called thematic, a thematic approach. Because you take a theme, and you look at what it says. Or we just follow the order, either from the beginning or the end. And we go verse by verse, we explain, we comment on the verses so that we understand what the Qur'an is actually saying. So for those of you who said, who have asked for a bit of an outline, this is generally, you know, if inshallah we keep going with this jalsa, the idea is that we would cover these, most of the topics that I mentioned, in one or a couple of lectures each. So as you can see, there's a lot. But at the end of the day, this is a very quick overview of the topics. At the end of which, all of you should be able to say, at least I have a general understanding of what Islam is. Before that, before actually talking about all of these topics, it's difficult for someone to say, I even know what Islam is. We need to understand how the what the belief system is, what the action system is, that's it. The, the system of laws or the Islamic law or usually we refer to it as fiqh and this is just a quick overview this is the, just explaining what it is without going into the details after this as we said depending on your level of interest and your discussions or throughout as we go along if a lot of you say we need to spend a lot more time on a certain topic it's as though we'll take a, a break from the big series and we can spend more time on a specific topic so I'll give you an example. Inshallah, in the next lesson, we'll talk about two big topics, one of them having to do with the different types of knowledge that we can have. So we can decide that we give a very high-level overview of different types of knowledge, or we can spend a lot more time, so a couple of lectures or more, talking specifically about one type of knowledge, which is science. Because there are so many questions and doubts and objections about this world and this word of science. What does it actually mean? How is science made? To what extent can we rely on it? Is it absolute truth or not? So if we spend time understanding how science is constructed, we're in a much better position to understand the real relationship between science of the natural world that we're being exposed to, let's say, in schools or elsewhere, and religion. The place of our religion versus science. This, we can talk about it for 10-15 minutes, or we can spend 10 lectures talking about it. There's a lot to say here. And there are in, there's an entire field in, that you can study at university called the philosophy of science. It's a very big field with very big thinkers and philosophers studying this relationship. What is science? How is it, what is it made of? How is it constructed? What's the amount of truth, the degree of truth that it can give us? And then we can take that and compare it with what we've said so far and we'll continue to say about religion. So this is just to give an example. Anyways, so this is generally speaking, the, the point of all of this was simply to say the structure that we are following for these lectures is so supposed to give you a broad overview of the entire system of our religion. So the idea is that we're not going in depth, we're just touching the surface, but we're going to try to cover all the foundations so that at the end of this someone can say, I have a, a general good overview understanding of our religion. And the rest, we're going to have to drill down a lot more, depending on your levels of interest. Sounds good? Okay, so that was a, a first thing that uh, I thought we, we should get out of the way, since uh, we probably didn't do a lot of that in the, first, uh, in the first lecture. So are there any questions about any of this? The general program, the general outline, the topics that we're going to address. Is there anything that you feel is missing from this? It's all good? Okay. Okay, so the second... Uh, as the second thing that we wanted to talk about today very quickly. So a number of you, you weren't here last week. We started a topic 
that has to do with the place of reason in Islam. Maybe better than me trying to summarize it. Let's see if anyone else who was in attendance last week can give a broad overview of what we said about that. And inshallah, we'll build on it today. Yeah. Okay, so basically, uh, the first thing you were saying is that is it important for reasoning to be in, the, in our religion or not? And the answer was yes, it is actually very important. It is the ground base of our religion. Uh, but you have to, I think, make, well, now I think, you know, uh, I, I think, I, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, that uh, you have to learn from the right places and uh, and you have to, and yeah, basically that's it. I, I don't remember that much. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Uh, you showed us some uh, old uh, old uh, scientists, like uh, for example Einstein, and we saw we said that they also believed in uh, in not Islam, like specifically, but they also believed in uh, a god and religion. So why did we say that? That was a an answer to what objection? To someone that says religion doesn't go together with reasoning, it's blind faith. Yeah. So you reply to them with those three reasons I think that you mentioned. So the the great like uh, scientists that are obviously using their brain and like are highly highly educated and they believed in 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 God or like a higher power. And then uh, another example was. The verses from the Quran, that was the last example. I can't remember the example of exactly that was in between them. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else remember? Uh, yeah, it's just uh, uh, to accept religion doesn't mean you have to park your reasoning. So you can accept reasoning and religion at the same time. But then Islam actually promotes reasoning uh, a lot more than, uh, than, usual, than other religions and uh, it tells you to use your reasoning a lot more. Yeah. So, to fill your, your second one, and it's a little bit what you said, which is basically the majority of people, the, the masses, anyone that you talk to, will say, I'm not ready to park my reasoning. It's not reasonable to expect someone to not use their logic. And... What we tried to do next was what you refer to, which is we went through the Holy Qur'an and we identified a few categories of verses that, that are spread out throughout the Qur'an that talk about different ways the Qur'an is asking people to use their minds and their brains, their reasoning, rationality, logic. So do you remember some of those ways that the Qur'an asked us to use our reasoning? Yeah. Uh, I remember some of them. Uh, one of them is, uh, uh, it says in the Qur'an, like, don't you question how uh, the bee goes through all the processes of it to get the uh, uh, a natural medicine for a human being? And it says in the, at the end, it's like, there's a, there, there's a sign for those who think in each one and the other one is uh, uh, that I remember is uh, uh, don't you see how much uh, empires have we give, given them uh, like rivers and we made them we nourished them uh, and they were so powerful but then now they're gone but and there's so many there's so many and then at the end it says there is a there is a sign for those who look at history in that and uh, yeah, those are the two I remember. Those two are, are very good. So we said one category, for and an example that we use is the natural signs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this universe in a way that everything is a sign pointing to Him. If you look at everything in the universe, there's a way to look at it that you only look at the thing itself. But there's another way to look at it where you see that this is a sign pointing towards God. You have to, it, ma it has to make you think beyond what you're seeing. The more you study it, the more you understand it, the more it makes you realize that it's pointing towards a creator. And we said that everything in nature, the Holy Quran teaches us about everything in nature being of that kind. 
So the first category, for instance, the bees fall in that category, where the Qur'an talks about the bees, as it talks about the heavens and the earth and the mountains and the rain and the night and day and the moon and the sun and so on and so forth. Right? We, we read a number of verses in that category. A second category was, don't forget, what we're trying to do is to look at different ways the Qur'an is ordering us to use our minds. So one of them is to study nature. Another one is to study history. Because the Qur'an says, do they not know, do they not see, do they, when they walk through the remnants the traces that are left by previous empires, previous nations, do they not see that they were even more powerful than you are? Do they not see that we had given them even more power than we have given you? Are you not going to take any lessons out of that? What happened to them? Why do they not exist today? Okay, so this is a second category. Does anyone remember a, a few other categories of, of ways the Qur'an is trying to force us, commanding us, instructing us to use our minds. Um, I remember also the one uh, where he, uh, he says about the, the, the sky and night. And, uh, and yeah. I think that's nature. That's all nature. That's all signs of nature. They're good. We did mention them. But that was all one category. And another category was history. Another category was just thinking in general. The Qur'an does promote knowledge in general. It says, هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Do those who know and those who do not know, can they, can, you, can they be equated? Can they be considered equal? Those who know, those who have knowledge, and those who do not have knowledge. And it does that a lot in the Qur'an. Throughout the Qur'an it does that. So that's the general verses. More than that, the Qur'an says, and of course, it's speaking very negatively about those people. It says there are people who follow conjecture. And we explained what conjecture is. We said there are people who follow things that are doubtful. Doubtful in the sense that you're only certain of it to 60%, to 80%. The Quran says this is unacceptable in matters of belief. You have to have 100% certainty. And the majority of people, they are mistaken because they fall in the category of simply following conjecture, of dhan. The Qur'an talks again and again about dhan. Inhum illa yakhrusun. It says it's only conjecture. They're only guessing. So, and the Qur'an basically says this is all wrong. Never follow those who only follow conjecture. What do they know? They only follow guesswork and conjecture. Okay, so that was another way where the Qur'an, this is more in a negative way, the Qur'an is saying, on the one side, telling us how to use our minds and what to do with them and about what, and on the other side, it's telling us what's not to do. So one way is, do not rely on conjecture. You have to be 100% sure. Another way, the Qur'an says, do not be of those who simply follow what their parents taught them. Following blindly what your parents taught you. Now we may think our parents know and they're good and we're supposed to respect them. And the Quran says, yes, you respect them. But respecting them and obeying them has nothing to do with following the truth. The Quran wants you to use your own mind and your own reasoning to reach the truth. And it says there are those who, when you try to tell them this is the truth, follow the truth, they say we're going to follow what we found our parents doing. And then the Qur'an comes back and says, but their parents do not know anything. So this is another category of verses in the Qur'an that are telling us how to not use our minds, which again comes back to reasoning and logic. And then we have the verses of the Qur'an that we said specifically talk about the Qur'an itself. So there are verses of the Qur'an that say you have to study the Qur'an. The Qur'an requires a deep introspection, a deep reflection, a deep studying. Right? We said the word. It's not just looking at it quickly. It's not looking at it at the surface. So it's inviting 
everyone not to take it for granted, to take it at surface value, at face value. You read the Qur'an and you accept it. The Qur'an doesn't want that from people. It says if someone wants to accept it, it, it needs to be based on deep, real studying and reasoning. So these were the big categories of verses that each of them, from a different angle, show us, insist on the role of reason from a different angle. So for someone after that to come and say, reason and religion are not compatible, or that Islam, for instance, expects people to follow blindly, it's someone who really doesn't understand what the Qur'an actually says about reason. And as we said, if you put all of these verses together, they are in the hundreds. There's probably four to five hundred verses in the Qur'an that fall in these six or seven categories. That's a lot of verses. One, one verse could have been enough to say the Qur'an says, follow your reason. So when the Qur'an has hundreds of verses, obviously this is a very important topic in the Qur'an. Right. Right? This part is clear? Okay. So, uh, not only that, the, uh, it's a question of nature. Okay. And then, uh, in English I'm not very good, but like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, he gives you a little bit of a based on those two. So, when you, you can all match them all together. Lamthal, based on the nature, yes. and based on the questioning part. That, and that's a very good point. And usually that goes under the first one, which is the importance of reasoning in general. We didn't go into it, but that's a very big topic. And anyone who studies, let's say, tafsir al-Qur'an, especially since we talked about it a little bit earlier, like thematic tafsir. So the tafsir based on a theme in the Qur'an, a big theme on which some of our scholars have written entire books is al-amthal. There are recently, there are at least two or three big tafasir that have come out that are two, between one and three volumes each that only take out the amthal in the Qur'an and they say, how does the Qur'an use the idea of, usually it's translated as a parable. Okay? The Qur'an talks about something and says, use that as an example for something else. A parable for something else. And it talks about the cow and the and the spider, and the previous people, and it gives stories. It says, imagine there are two people, they have people working for them. One of them has people who, who listen when they, when they give them orders, and the other one, they don't listen. Do they consider them equal or not? So many examples, dozens of examples in the Qur'an. And the point of all of them is what? Is that you just understand the example, or that you are studying the example so that you can apply it to something else. So again, very good, very good point, very good example that the Qur'an insists on the idea of examples or al-amthal, which basically says the role of reason is very important in our religion.